Um, so let's go in order of performance. So Artemy. So in this piece, the um, the machine learning has been trained on data from past performances, and essentially it has been trained on the performer's interpretative choices. Um, so so far, uh, I've trained the neural network with uh, data from Xenia from from rehearsals we did about a month ago, and uh, Magda Mayas, who is another pianist based in Berlin. So essentially, the neural network learns how performers um, navigate the, diver the different timbres, the different playing techniques involved in the piece, and proposes musical changes uh, based on what it's ha it has learned. So the sound files that were played back uh, were these uh, propositions by the uh, neural network. Should I pass the microphone Great. on? Great, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, so there are some similar elements in, in the work you heard from, from me and Benjamin. Um, there's also machine improvisation, which is learning from what Benjamin is playing in the performance and then continuing or responding. Um, there's a, another dimension of the machine learning, which is not around the improvisation. It's more about the space. And I should add uh, also a big thank you to the Sound Music Research Group of University of Greenwich, who uh, al graciously allowed us to use this wonderful 20-sided loudspeaker, the Eco, and this 32-sided microphone, the Eigen mic. And so the, um, there's a machine learner inside the patch that's been trained on a database of orchestral instruments, about 40 different instruments. And in response to what Benjamin is playing, um, it tries to choose the right spatialization pattern in the eco, in the room, for a particular sound. So that's also a kind of machine uh, improvisation, machine learning uh, performance. Great. And I'm going to briefly ask both of the performers if they can uh, tell us their uh, experiences and sensations from playing with these systems. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with uh, this kind of uh, <laughs> explanation, but uh, I can tell that uh, it was a little bit challenging <laughs> because of um, you know when you you play this kind of stuff, <laughs> uh, we we don't know when um, the, the, the machine the the sound is going to to, to sound. So it was. Uh, each time a very different uh, way to react from the sound and to me to, to perform. So it was the, the big deal of this, and it was the, the interesting part, uh, interesting part <laughs> of everything. So, voila. I have to say I really enjoyed the process. Um, it was also challenging, especially the first rehearsal, uh, it was like playing with somebody who's not really responding or not really listening. And then it changed. It really changed. It really grew. And I felt that tonight, actually, we could make music together. We, I felt like we were making music together. And I didn't feel like that in the first rehearsal. And the second rehearsal already changed because we trained the algorithm. And um, But interestingly, I don't know, did you do any additional training rounds between the rehearsals and okay because it did feel different tonight so of course it responds also differently depending on the piano depending on the space and so on um, and this piano is very different from the one we used to train so um, yeah I mean I don't know if that's a good answer I don't want to ramble on too much but I, I really kind of enjoyed it in a weird way thank you um, I'm going to hand over to Chris to briefly explain what was going on in your piece. Yeah, okay, so um, I'm a bit on the outside here because nothing I was doing is doing anything at all clever with um, machine learning or things like that. Um, and in fact, the connection to AI is slightly oblique. Um, so... Um, Probably the easiest uh, way in is just to simply say that um, the majority of the sounds uh, in my, well, it was really two pieces, um, are derived from 
difference tones, basically, um, and different methods, different synthesis methods for generating difference tones. Um, these are um, sounds that occur in the kind of um, neurobiology of the ear. Um, so in that second uh, sort of piece, um, you probably experienced this um, sensation that was a little bit like headphone listening um, in the sense that the sounds, um, well, at the start, they probably seemed quite indeterminate in space, but then suddenly um, start to get closer and closer to the point where they're, they seem to be inside your ears. Um, and these uh, are actually um, kind of objectively verifiable sounds that do arise in the ears. Um, hearing scientists call them distortion product autoacoustic emissions. Uh, musicians call them different tones. Um, so the majority of the piece uh, the, of what you heard was, was derived from those kinds of effects. Um, now, um, to kind of <laughs> get to AI in this is a, a slightly um, a messy uh, kind of set of associations, but um, I, the, 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 the composer that is most associated with that, this kind of music is called Marianne Amateur. Um, and she's Ameri an American composer um, and sound artist that uh, became most associated with this, this kind of um, approach to uh, composition. And um, she generated these sounds using a kind of, if you like, primitive kind of music AI, AI technology. Um, so um, it was one of the first digital music instruments um, that was kind of mass marketed. Um, and it was developed by a kind of AI um, guru called Marvin Minsky, who you might have um, heard of. And uh, she basically de derived all of these kinds of techniques from um, working with this, this artificial intelligence device that he created. So um, in terms of uh, AI, um, I guess the methods that I'm working with and the kind of um, uh, world that I'm in is, is a sort of, uh, you know, primitive version of AI or a kind of prehistory to contemporary AI. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think that that's probably, I'll, I'll end up just talking too much if I, uh, if I'd say any more. <laughs> it's a garden of forking paths. But, um, no, that's great. And, and this is, uh, everyone who wasn't at our conference should be aware that we've we've had a lot of interesting discussion about You're this. in the middle of a discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're midway through a conversation. Um, but what, I mean, what really strikes me, um, seeing all of these works and coming back to looking at performance in this space, which I've worked in in the past but not recently, is that um, uh, it's quite hard work deci even deciding what on earth it means to do performance with AI. Like there's not, there's, there's no, I mean, there's the most obvious thing that someone can do with music and AI is, is train a model that generates melodies or musical content. But as soon as you're in a performance context, um, there's actually no obvious go-to way to do this. I think um, both of your works explored these spaces where you might have an, an, an initial metaphor of what you're doing, but by the time you're developing the work, you're, you're sort of forking away from that metaphor and finding um, completely different uh, ways of thinking about what you're doing. So I'm wondering if um, both Artemy and Aaron, you've, like how you would, I mean, moving away from the technical description, how you would describe what you're doing. In your piece, for example, Aaron, I. I, I was starting to think in terms of delay lines and um, pieces I know that, that work with long delay lines and, and sort of weird delay lines that don't faithfully repeat what you're doing. Um, but I know that I think there were samples, pre-recorded samples in there and so on. So um, I was clutching for different metaphors of what was going on. How, how do you actually see the piece? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I think... That, that is a nice way to sort of change, change the subject, if you will, because we do have these sort of typical metaphors of music AI, you know, the sort of compose, compose the music for you or improvise the music for you. And, and I think there are connections 
to those metaphors in the pieces you heard tonight, but I think there are also sort of other propositions for what AI could be good for if you're a creator. Um, and so, you know, there are some elements where the um, structure of the score was produced through some of these sort of mosaicing tasks, which are at their base made from from a machine learning agent, or um, uh, you know, there's more of a concept of almost like a kind of piano pedal metaphor, like you know, what if the percussionist can play something and it just kind of keeps keeps going, but in a way that's a little bit unpredictable, and that could also be something a a little AI agent could do. Maybe it's not a very smart AI agent, maybe it's a kind of dumb little AI agent, but it still could serve a kind of creative function that maybe you know was a bit different before or we didn't have quite the same technique before. So I think, yeah, for me, it's, it's also about thinking about this as a tool that doesn't have to sort of fulfill that you know, more kind of cybernetic metaphor, set of metaphors of what AI can mean or, or do in music. Did you want to respond as well, Artemy? Great. So, yeah, I think that my piece was uh, meant to be a duo between the pianist and uh, the system, and I think that it was very much a duo. I, it was uh, quite clear how uh, Xenia was responding to the system as well, and how the sounds proposed by the system changed uh, her actions. And uh, um, so this system essentially has learned from Xenia's uh, data. It has also learned from Magda's data. So it sort of mirrors their uh, decisions, their interpretive choices, but uh, in a kind of distorted way, if that makes sense. So they're sort of in dialogue with their past interpretative choices and with each other's choices um, as well. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and uh, the 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 issue is raised, um, I think, by Benjamin of of how it's quite hard to play with a system like this because you don't know what it's going to do next. And um, Xenia, you 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 were describing how you felt like you got to know it, and you you that helped you perform with it. Um, we had a lot of discussion about um, anthropo anthropomorphization. It's too late in the day for me to say a word like that. Um, and and how much we depend on it and how hard it is to avoid it. And we've already been using words. Um, some some words which um, uh, are, are, are clearly anthropomorphizations and other words like dumb or intelligent that, that um, I'm a bit more on the fence about whether we... Um, whether they derive from thinking about people always or whether they, they can kind of stand alone. Um, so maybe a question to the performers if you're if you're up for um, getting into this is is you know did, was it helpful for you to project um, the, the idea that you're playing with someone else even if you know you're not and even if it might be a simplistic version of a Another performer, or or was it helpful you to helpful for you to just think of this as a system, um, or or was it helpful maybe just to switch off and just think about your part and um, not worry too much about the interaction? Um, I I think actually it was kind of a hindrance in a way because when I when we started this project I. Actually, I just literally came from another performance in here with a really experienced, amazing improviser. We had a duo concert, and I was sort of buzzing, and I thought, wow, it's so great to play with somebody who's actually much better than I am, you know, and I can, it sort of drags the whole level up. And it was, it was actually kind of difficult and a disappointment coming to work with the system, and I was thinking, <laughs> okay, this is just not gelling. It's just not happening. So in a way, having that human comparison is not helpful. I think, um, and yeah, gradually it sort of, it changed and, and settled and developed. So I don't know, I, I don't know really what to say, but I think when we start comparing to humans, I'm not sure if it always uh, works. What do you think? I think uh, I agree with you. It was not very uh, helpful to, um, how 
autoservice. Um, in, to, in my part, I was not thinking uh, to, to play with uh, a human. It was totally for me uh, a song from a machine, but it was not human. It was, um, it was quite like uh, a sound from a machine was living. And uh, it was not a, a duo. It was, uh, for me, it was, it was just a, a solo. But uh, with some of um, properties, I don't know how to say it in English. But um, uh, voilà, it was not. It was sorry. It was not uh, for me a duo, and it was not helpful, like uh, you said, to think it about uh, to be a human. It's, uh, Um, I've just got one more question, and then um, if if other people want to ask anything to our performers, yeah, yeah, yeah go on. Yeah, sorry. Um, I I just wondered. Um, maybe this is a really stupid idea, but um, how, in terms of anthropomorphism, how interesting would it be to actually um, have your two systems uh, in dialogue together and take out the human in terms of actually. Uh, you know, understanding how these machines listen um, and and what is what is going on with them um, outside of human metaphors. Um, how how useful would that be? Would it be really stupid? <laughs> so this is going to be a very long night. Now we're going to have the systems improvise. <laughs> She's going. <home. laughs> I mean, um, the thing is that uh, my system at least would always produce some output, but it would be less meaningful, I think. It would be a less meaningful interaction because it is listening for these specific timbres, these specific playing techniques that uh, Xenia was using. So essentially it, was, it would just map all these percussive sounds to the closest uh, of these timbres and it would still produce something, but uh, whether that would make any sense musically is questionable. We can try it, though, if you... I'd like to. <laughs> if you're... Yeah, th thank you, Christopher. I mean, it's a really instructive question because I think sort of the humor and exposes some of the kind of limitations as well. Um, I was thinking of what wouldn't happen. I mean, how would it even begin? Because in a way, both of our systems are responsive, sort of neither one... Oh, mine can start, actually. Can it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Which we didn't get, we didn't hear tonight, right? Xenia began both both performances, but that's okay. So, the, so your piece would, yours would begin because mine is not not clever enough for that. Um, how would it end? You know, in both of our cases, somebody has to make decisions about that, and um, yeah, it's it's definitely something that that neither system is is really capable of or smart about. So, um, I think one slight difference between our systems is, um, I mean, Ali. Uh, alluded to this before, that there's a kind of sleight of hand in mind that the material that's being diffused, that's being synthesized is all pre-recorded, but it's all pre-recorded with the exact same instruments. So intentionally, you might confuse the pre-recorded sounds with the live ones, but sometimes it responds with the same sounds or it's allowed to respond with the same sounds that, that Benjamin plays. Other times I don't allow it to do that. So there are certain moments you might remember in the piece where he's playing one set of instruments and the speaker is only allowed to respond using a using the drum, using a different instrument. And so that might be a kind of moment that would be more interesting to think about in dialogue with Artemis system, you know, to put the systems in a situation where they're kind of not allowed to succeed in a sense. So that all they can do is produce errors, but maybe they could be fun errors. Okay, well we'll come back to eclectic and do this sometime <laughs> next show. Um, my final question was just going to be about this bizarre object and what's it like to compose for this. And you said you're you, you're you're using AI to control space, and I, I'm I'm really I, I think that's a really exciting application because um, it it's it's just an area like you know when when we talk about simulating musicians and all all that kind of stuff then. We've got musicians, and um, it's it's a it creates this bizarre kind of 
quirky area, but when we're talking about controlling a 20 speaker system, then immediately there are all of these things that we, we don't do very well because we, you know, we can move sounds around, but, but to kind of explore that potential is, is wide open. Um, can you tell us, just tell us a bit more about, about what composing on this is like and how it compares to um, the inward pointing version and so on? Yeah, thank, thanks, Ali. The, and so this was the first project in which I worked with this speaker, and it, it seemed a kind of logical outgrowth because I had done work with ambisonic domes like the, the Amina system that, that Artemy used and Christopher used today. Um, so it was sort of a logical next step, but in a way maybe I wasn't even quite prepared how different it would be. And, you know, we've all, as trained composers and, and performers, we've sort of spent years, decades, learning how to work with traditional speakers, and suddenly all those rules kind of didn't work anymore. This speaker behaves in a really different way and one that was very unpredictable for me with a background working with traditional speakers. Um, one major difference is how much it's affected by the space that it's in. Um, and so yesterday when I showed up here with it, it suddenly sounded completely different than it had in a drier studio where I'd been working before, which is also what's exciting about it, um, because in a way it kind of plays the space almost a bit more than a traditional speaker might. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot of reflections off the walls rather than, or in addition to, direct signals. So I think it actually, you know, could point to different ways of working, like the kind of standard computer musician, I'm gonna compose my piece in a dry studio and then I'm gonna take it to the concert hall and play my gig, kind of doesn't work for this object anymore. So we actually, let's say we're all gonna compose for this in the future or things like it, we'd have to kind of rethink our social arrangements too of where do you rehearse, where do you compose, how do you test things out, how do you check your material, where do you work with a performer? You know, if, I mean, for, we got to work in the space yesterday, but if we had worked in a different space another day, it probably would have been a really different experience. So um, yeah, so I think it's, it's challenging, but a really fruitful challenge and one I hope to keep, keep working on. Um, and I mean, I have to also say this is a really beautiful space for it because it's a live space. It's a space with sort of complex angles. Um, you know, it's much more fun to hear the eco in here than in a sort of dry black box or something like that. Um, so, yeah, put, getting you know getting this thing in a in a transit van, putting it in a new, in a new place. It's a big hassle, but it also is uh, you know really worth it in a way. Yeah. A bit more compact than this system. But <laughs> um, does anyone have a burning question or uh, comment? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm just interested to hear a bit more about the, is it ICO? About, uh, about how it technically works. Like just a bit more detail, I'd really love. I'll, I'll try to keep it short so we're not, 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 not here too long. Um, it's, it's, it's basically just a 20-sided 20, 20, speaker, so it has 20 high-quality speakers on, arranged in a sphere, and you could control it any way you could control 20 speakers. So you could send sound to one speaker at a time if you wanted. In my computer patch, it just outputs 1 to 20, and I just send sounds there. But there are different techniques people have sort of been working on how you could think about it in a logical way. One technique which I'm, I'm not really using is um, people work with what, are, what they call focused beams, so you can kind of get the speakers to work together to project a sound in a particular direction, and often that's really exciting to work with wall reflections, so you can sort of get the sense of a virtual source bouncing off the wall. That's not the particular approach I've taken to it. Um, I was interested in this idea of kind of modeling it on acoustic instruments, and so um, rather than the sort of beam Pretty much every sound you heard was coming from all 20 speakers at once, but with different intensities. And those intensities come from measurements of different traditional acoustic instruments. So I was treating it like a kind of metaphor, kind of stand-in for different kinds of acoustic instruments. Great. Um, any other questions? Thank you. I've been listening to you guys for two days now, and I have burning questions too. <laughs> um, I this will be a very long thing to explain, actually. But I was actually thinking about like how, in what extent does the 
um, machine learning can comprehend things and like what could be better to um, make it interact with more with the artist Um, so uh, the first question was, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part? Was it... Uh, how, like, how much does the machine learning can comprehend hmm. the, the, the sound here? Like I'm, I'm thinking about like the midis and the audios because they're like very different disciplines and like how, in what extent does it actually like separates the, the different instruments that has been there and like the, the different sounds that they're making. It's like, or is it just like the frequency or the rhythmic uh, order? It's just that. Yeah. Um, so um, I can only talk about my piece and in this piece it just recognizes uh, the different timbres. For example, there are all these noisy sounds, these scratchy sounds in the um, low range of the piano. Then there are these high frequencies, an effect that Xenia used with um, a tape that she was um, rubbing. So it just recognizes these different timbres. But what's important is that it needs to have a frame of reference, right? So it can only recognize sounds it was trained to recognize. And essentially that's the whole world for this algorithm. So even if you grab the microphone and speak into it, it will try to fit it into one of these categories that it knows, the cate you know, one of these timbres. So maybe your voice is closer to the scratchy sounds, for instance. So it's a very interesting way, a very interesting approach to listening, but it's also extremely limited. So it can only recognize uh, yeah, the things that it was trained to recognize and nothing else, uh, basically. Aaron, I don't know if you would like to say. Um, yeah, very interesting question. I, I think, I mean, in a way, our, our two agents, in terms of what, how they interpret input, are pretty similar. They, they, have a, they do a kind of temporal analysis on a, a range of input descriptors. Um, but I guess I was, I was going to say that some, sometimes the system is kind of getting right answers, it's, you know, being asked to recognize a certain sound and it does it and it does a good job and it's a good, good, good little system. But um, in a way, I think as a composer, I found those uh, maybe not the most interesting things that it could do. And I was maybe more interested in putting it in situations where there weren't any right answers. And so, you know, for example, this idea about the orchestral instruments, you know, we have as an input, these percussion instruments, homemade instruments, you know, instruments made from natural materials, there is no right answer of, you know, does a scallop shell sound more like a tuba or more like a violin? I don't know. So I think that that's for me where it's more exciting because, um, you know, it's not right or it's it's not right or wrong, but that sort of space of of in between possibilities leads to sort of unpredictable and unexpected moments. And the other question was, what would be better? Sorry, <laughs> what would be better if you just like try to like engage with the artist more is is that the question yes like how how would it be better like interact with the with the system uh, with the with the artist sorry yeah i mean um I think that uh, in its current form, my system is quite limited in what it listens for. So it just recognizes these uh, clusters of sounds that are in the score, but it really uh, does not, for example, take into account the density of musical events, how many sounds are being played in a second, how sparse or dense uh, the soundscape is. It also doesn't take into account dynamics, so yeah, it's it's a very reductive way of listening. Uh, so I think that yeah, these kind of things would make it a bit richer. Uh, yeah, Aaron. I, I well, I guess I I think I um I'm a little bit of a like stricter stricter parent for my system than Artemy is because I it's it's quite limited throughout the piece what it can do, and that also has to do with the fact that it's a pretty m mostly traditionally notated score. There are certain more open moments, but there are many moments that are very specifically notated. So to kind of go along with that, the system itself also has a kind of very strict 
organization and it's allowed to do certain things at certain times. So I guess maybe to answer your question, I would, I would sort of try to make, you know, see what happens when my system is thrown out into sort of the, the dangerous world of more free improvisation like Artemis and see, see how it does. Cheers. Um, sorry, this is a slightly insider question because I also do this sort of thing. Um, three nouns have come up quite a lot. There's been piece, stroke work, and there's been system, and there's been instrument. And this is a question for everyone involved in tonight's performance of where these, I'm going to say a fashionable word, assemblages, um, for you, like phenomenologically, experientially, have sat, and where you find the difference. Like as a composer, where do you see the difference between a work and a system? And as a performer, where do you see the difference between a system and an instrument? Great question. Keep it. Like, two two word answers. <laughs> The question was where th where do you see the boundary between the two? Where do you experience it? Where do I experience it? Um, gosh. Um, I mean, with focusing on work, I, I feel like work has always been um, problematic. Um, in the ways in which it sort of infers um, permanence and fixity and and so on. Um, and the type of music that's most um, kind of amenable to that concept is actually, I would say, probably electroacoustic music, fixed media electroacoustic music. Um, but anybody that works in that domain knows just how... Um, kind of plastic it is when you move into different spaces and, and so on. Um, so um, in relation to the kinds of silly stuff I'm interested in, um, you know, those kinds of works, I mean, the second part of that work was just totally fixed, you know, um, so there's no, nothing um, going on in terms of the machine doing anything um, that it wouldn't do in another circumstance. But um, uh, every time I've played it, um, the results are radically different. Um, I mean, tonight, um, I was desperately um, concerned that it was just too loud in the second part and I was next to that big sheet of perspex um, which had an um, influence on that. Um, so uh, absolutely playing the work in this context is you, you're in a sort of systemic uh, kind of world rather than a kind of work kind of world. Um, <clears throat> Could go on to instrument, but I'm not going to. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Aaron and Artemy speak. <laughs> Should I speak while well, you're okay? <laughs> Great. So um, yeah, I think my piece plays a little bit with the boundaries between instrument and system. Um, so the interactive music system um, is. Uh, partly uh, another augmentation of the piano uh, because it applies signal processing techniques to the input signal. So essentially it's also another type of preparation. So the piano is prepared. I don't know how much of that you were able to hear. So there are different objects inside the strings uh, that are used to modify the timbre and then the electronics also modify the timbre. So in that sense it's sort of an instrument but also it can be quite unpredictable. Um, and then uh, the sounds, the, the sound samples that the system plays back, uh, there, there were definitely in the category uh, system rather than instrument because there is no way the performer can predict those and uh, they also have an impact on the performer's action. So you have to respond. There is a sound coming at you and you have to do something to respond in that moment. So that's uh, clearly not an instrument. 
um, anymore. But yeah, in general, I would say that it's, it's, uh, it plays with the boundaries uh, between the two. Well, thanks for the great question, Owen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to maybe tackle an angle on the question that has less obviously to do with machine learning, but maybe it does, I don't know, which is um, I, I think one of the boundaries that's really interesting for me is the instrument and piece. Um, because actually, um, you know, in some ways I think you kind of couldn't make another piece with this instrument. The instrument kind of is the piece, and that's also a bit kind of why in, in making it, we made the decision to kind of introduce the audience to building the instrument during the piece because that sort of was our process also in making it and sort of introducing everybody to that process seemed like it was, actually that was the piece. So that sort of autobiographical moment of of experimentation actually became the performative moment of, of presenting it. So I don't know if that has anything to do with machine learning, but but it doesn't mean it's not interesting. How about environment, rather than instrument or piece or uh, what was the other word, system? Environment, like a world that you inhabit, you have certain limitations and rules, but then you have freedom within that. I don't know, that's maybe nice as well. Do you want to add anything? <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just definitely <laughs> too late uh, for me to, un <laughs> to, <laughs> to answer this question. Uh, Voila. <laughs> no, uh, it was uh, it, it was great to, to to play to play this kind of um, of, of piece, and um, yeah, the, the thing to I continue in French. It's better. Oui. Oui, oui. Du coup, uh, ce qui est vraiment bien, c'est de pouvoir jouer avec des instruments acoustiques comme tu le disais tout à l'heure. What's really nice is to play these acoustic instruments, that, yeah. as I was saying before. Mm -hmm. Et à partir de là, d'avoir réussi à les articuler dans une pièce qui mêle euh, percussion, bande et euh, machine learning, ça, c'était vraiment la, la chose intéressante pour moi. Okay, and, and the interesting thing was to put it together in a piece that uh, takes the instruments, the electronics, and the machine learning uh, together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, du coup. Uh, Voilà, moi je reste dans, ma, dans mon rôle de percussionniste, de musicien, d'artiste, et, euh, et ça s'est fait naturellement, et je n'ai pas eu besoin de m'interroger en me disant euh, est-ce du machine learning, est-ce euh, est -ce que c'est ça, est-ce que c'est ça, j'ai juste joué, c'était cool. Ok, donc so Benjamin remained in his role as an interpreter, as a percussionist, and he actually didn't find that he needed to interrogate uh, what was machine learning, what was the piece, what was that, that uh, he could continue in his role as interpreter? <laughs> I think that might be a good point to end it. Oh, uh, do you want to make a short comment? I <laughs> um, so, so another word that came up uh, tonight was timber. And I just wanted to ask Artemi and Aaron, um, you know, do, do, did you work with timbre before? Is that kind of like standard in your compositional practice? Or is it something that working with technology nowadays and machine learning and AI has kind of pushed you to, to, to bring out? Um, for, for me, it's sort of the other, other way around. Um, it's been a topic that I've been interested in for kind of a, a, a really long time. So I think what was interesting for me was to try to bring machine learning into that world, because actually some of the some of the tools that I'm using were developed at first to work kind of with more symbolic traditional musical parameters like pitch and rhythm, and so I actually had to kind of adapt them to work with noisy sounds and with timbres instead. Um, so I, yeah, it was more about bringing the machine learning into my sound world than the other way around. Yeah, I think I agree with Aaron. For me, it was the, um, the same process. I was already interested uh, in timbre, working with it, and actually, it it has been quite challenging um, using machine learning for timbre recognition because, um, yeah, just the audio descriptors that are available um, deviate significantly from auditory perception of timbre. So this has always been a uh, 
a challenge, essentially, trying to um, teach your machine listening system to perceive timbre in the same way uh, that we do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, should we thank our performers once again for an incredible night? I, sh I should say, compo composers and performers and composer performers and, um, and software agents that we will, might meet one day. Um, and again, to thank Eclectic and to thank um, Georgina, who I'm pretty sure logged out a long time ago and is fast asleep. Um, and the European Research Council who have been funding all of this activity. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>